pray with me? Father in heaven, it's so sweet it is to trust in you, to trust in your salvation that comes through your son, Jesus Christ, and to trust that for all who have turned from sin, placed their faith entirely leaning upon, trusting in the name of Jesus and the work of Jesus, that we are raised to eternal life, forgiven of all our sin, past, present, and future, filled with your Holy Spirit, who is with us even now, who fills this place as we sing your praises. Oh, we pray and ask God that you would fill this place in a particularly powerful way this morning, that those who are dead now spiritually would come to life through the preaching of your word the proclamation of the gospel that those who are alive in christ but the reality is are struggling under the weight of so many trials including their own sin and the trials that may be coming because of that god we're struggling we're weak and we are needy and we're calling out to you from the first song, blessed be your name, God, in every season and circumstance, all the way to the medley of hymns we just sang, that we praise your name, we trust your name, and we need you, God, to do the change in us continually that we cannot accomplish in and of ourselves. So would you take me now, in my, in my weakness, and would you prove strong? And the foolishness of what is preached in the world's eyes, would you demonstrate your wisdom in saving sinners and in sanctifying those you have saved to raise us up and grow us up in the Lord? So God, the needs in this room are more than I could fathom, but you know each and every one of them. And so as we get started in the preaching of the word, having sung your praises, would you continue ministering to us and through the word that you bring this morning. We ask this, trusting it, in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 I encourage you to stay standing for the reading of God's word. This morning we are coming out of Ezekiel chapter 14. And I will explain why in just a moment. But first we will read God's word for this morning. Ezekiel 14, verses 1 through 8. Then certain of the elders of Israel came to me and sat before me, and the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, these men have taken their idols into their hearts and set the stumbling block of their iniquity before their faces. Should I indeed let myself be consulted by them? Therefore speak to them and say to them, Thus says the Lord God. Any one of the house of Israel who takes his idols into his heart and sets the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and yet comes to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him as he comes with the multitude of his idols, that I may lay hold of the hearts of the house of Israel who are all estranged from me through their idols. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, Repent and turn away from your idols. Turn away your faces from all your abominations. For any one of the house of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn in Israel, who separates himself from me, taking his idols into his heart and putting the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and yet comes to a prophet to consult me through him, I, the Lord, will answer him myself. And I will set my face against that man. I will make him a sign and a byword and cut him off from the midst of my people. And you shall know that I am the Lord. This is the word of the Lord for this morning. You may be seated. Well, good morning, church. Good morning, one and all. And good morning to those of you who are joining us on a live stream from wherever you are on the planet. We're glad that you're with us, worshiping the Lord Jesus. My name is Chris, and I'm one of the pastors here at Doxus, a joy to bring you God's word this morning. And we are indeed breaking for one week from the book of Jonah. This is kind of like one of those, we interrupt this regularly scheduled broadcast 
to bring you this one-off or standalone sermon, and I recognize, hasn't Jonah been so good? So good, and we are six weeks down and one week to go, and I recognize you guys, I was about the only one who knew what I was doing today, all right? And you all thought, man, we're finishing up, Jonah, let's go. And so I want to just recognize the collective grief that you all have. This is not the week we're doing it, so on the count of three, just a, oh, uh, just let's get it all out, all right? One, two, I'm not kidding, one, two, three, come on, oh, uh, doesn't that feel better? Are you ready to dial in on what the Lord has for today, surprised as you were uh, or are, uh, that what we're doing is not Jonah. We will finish it next week, and very excited to do that. So as Pastor Scott and I were talking about this sermon, though, and, and what might go in this week, it became evident as Jonah was going on that there was a, a theme that had run through a couple of messages um, about idols. And Jonah in chapter 2 even talks about the worthlessness of vain idols. That's part of his prayer when he's in the belly of the great fish. And then we really see Jonah in his tremendous anger, his angry prayer at the Lord, a demonstration of really his own idolatry, his anger at God, that you would be merciful. I knew you were compassionate and slow to anger. I knew you would relent from disaster. We see how just idolatrously he wanted the destruction of his enemies. And he's got like some bad prophet, good prophet, bad prophet. That's kind of the move of Jonah, right? He's moving back into this place of just, we see his idolatrous desire to see his enemies destroyed. And, and um, we talked to a lot of people that said, man, that, that stuff that you've gone into, Pastor Scott, or I heard from a number of you, man, that was just convicting. Right between the eye stuff about the idols in my own life, I need to understand that some more. And so here it is. This is what we're going to do. This is a thematic message today about what you might call idols of the heart or heart idolatry. It's a term that some of you likely know, no doubt, but I bet it's new to many of you. Um, Ezekiel 14 is probably not like on the top five list of very many of our you know, favorite Bible passages, right? Uh, but this is where it comes from. And so we're going to get into it today about heart idolatry, where the principle of it comes from. We're going to look at Ezekiel 14, but this is going to be a, a thematic message, admittedly. And so let's get to work. The big idea for those note takers among us here, big idea is this, your ability to change is directly related to understanding, identifying, and repenting of your heart idolatry. Your ability to change is directly tied to understanding, identifying, and repenting of your heart idolatry. And before we get personal and oh baby we will don't you worry i'm here for you we want i want to scale back a bit though to to understand what i'm going to call cultural idolatry and my proposal my thesis in this section is to say this that this idolatry paradigm really is the best framework for understanding the times that we are in today can we all admit we're in some crazy times today right Crazy times, politically, culturally, globally. Things that are being spread within minutes around the world of what's going on. And there's so much happening at a dizzying pace. And it may be tempting to, to be overwhelmed to the degree that you're not uh, putting any pieces together. It, it all seems disparate. It all seems like this random piece of information coming out of Russia or out of China. Or this information about COVID. And the federal government's doing this. And states are doing that. And right, all it all seems disconnected and we don't have a grid by which to interpret it and then also connect it back to what the Bible would actually have to say about it. And so I want to propose to you that a language of idolatry to understand the times in which we are in is very important to become proficient at. So what is an idol? Let's give a definition here. What's an idol? An idol is anything or anyone that takes the place of God and is worshipped, served, and honored as if it were God. Anything or anyone that takes the place of God and is worshipped, served, and honored as if it were God. So I want to help you think in terms of 
idolatry even in our world today. Because the question is never, you got to hear this, it's never do people worship or do they not worship. It's whom or what are they worshiping. Because we as created beings by Almighty God bearing His image were created to worship and worship we do. Everybody is worshiping, giving themselves in honor, in allegiance, in commitment, in sacrifice to something or some people or some uh, maybe you know entity, as it were, other than the living God. See, Adam and Eve, our first parents, when they sinned, they believed a word other than God's word. They went their own way, and as sin broke into the world through Adam and Eve's sin and wreaked havoc upon humanity, humanity, we are now bearing those consequences still today, being born in a fallen world, ourselves fallen, and by nature in our Adamness, we are in Adam, Romans 5, we are in rebellion against the living God, which is another way of saying worshiping anything and just about everything besides the living God. This is one way to ex- understand sin. In fact, Romans 1 lays this out. And we have preached through Romans 1 at the beginning of our Now Concerning series that in, in sin we've made a great exchange. We have exchanged the glory of the immortal God for created things. We've exchanged the creator for the creation. And we've worshipped and served the images of various beasts and animals and people and worshiping ourselves, and we have made that exchange. Every last one of us, this is a universal condition of sin. It's a description of what idolatry is. And really the story of Scripture is um, understood as the threat of idolatry from beginning to end. From Genesis to Revelation, idolatry abounds. So again, it's not, is is that person a worshiper? Do, do, do they worship? No, it's what are we worshiping and who are we worshiping at any given time. This helps make sense of the first two of the Ten Commandments. God delivers Israel out of slavery from Egypt and he establishes covenant relationship with him. And his first two commandments are related to idolatry. Exodus 20 verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. And Exodus 20 verse 4, I'm paraphrasing here, but you shall not make any carved image nor bow down and serve to them. So the first two of the Ten Commandments relate to idolatry, and yet what is Israel's history but a study in idolatry? It's a study in repeated, habitual idolatry, mixing in with the nations around them, and those nations were tied directly to their pagan false gods and their idols. And even though he called them to be unique in the world, to not mix with the nations because of their false religion, each nation had a religion or religions, but they repeatedly fell into idolatry and fell into God's judgments. Now, it would be easy to say, man, People in the ancient times had all those statues, right? They had all those idols. And it's even so grotesque the way people in ancient times would even sacrifice their babies to false gods. You know, that's what they did. Many nations, to appease gods or to live in a certain manner, would actually sacrifice their babies. But did you know that the satanic temple is suing the state of Texas? for precisely the right to do just that. They have, this is in response to Texas's new abortion law. They have, and I quote from their own website, yes, I dared to go. Here's what they say. They have a ceremonial affirmation of self-worth and bodily autonomy. This is the satanic temple, a ritual in Satanism that includes the abortive process. How's that for the darkness coming into the light? You know, you rattle the cage of the sacred cows in our culture, such as abortion, and you see just the religious nature of it. You see the worship of it. You see what's given over to it. And when we learn the language of idolatry, we learn to understand how to interpret things going on culturally, socially, and also personally. So here's... Here's what we do in idolatry as humans. In idolatry, 
Sinful humanity elevates good things beyond their God-given place, perverts things defined by God, gives undue allegiance to people to save them, and lets government tyrannically rule as if they were God. Let me give you just one example, because my time is limited, believe it or not. One example of each of those phrases I just read off for you. First of all, they elevate, we, I should say, elevate good things, gifts of God beyond their God-given place, such as sex. And the sex-crazed culture that we're in is a demonstration of blatant idolatry of the human body and of autonomy and of rebellion against God. And for what it's worth, you've got to realize pornography is profoundly idolatrous, quite literally setting up before you an image of your stumbling on the screen or in your head. Pornography is idolatrous. What about perverting things defined by God, like, for example, the word justice, that God has a clear definition through his word in but instead in our culture it's been perverted flipped on its head definition changed and now justice humanly so called is worshiped at the altar of the social justice movement what about undue allegiance to people to save us i don't know things like trust the experts the cult of expert is a popular phrase right now to talk about the hope and the utter allegiance we give to science or really scientism in a lot of ways these days to protect us, to keep us alive. And even though they never admit when they're wrong and they've been more wrong in public health and times we could even count these days, the last 18 months, they never admit it. The hypocritical nature of their flip-flopping is seen all the time. False promises. We, the experts, will keep you safe. We can save you out of what we're facing. What about governing authorities lusting for more power than God has given them? They are servants, deacons, Romans 13 says, under God. And yet the history of humanity shows, and I'm not only talking about our nation, though it is true here, shows that when you give man Men and women, power, we lustfully desire more to have a godlike status over the state, the country that we are in. And by the way, that's nothing new. That was happening for the past four years as well, lest you think I'm only taking a shot at one side. It's everywhere. And that's really just the tip of the iceberg, right? But those are kind of easy shots. Like, yeah, yeah, those are bad guys. And yeah, out there. But we got to talk about our own idolatry. And that's what I want to get to when it comes to heart idolatry. Learning the language of idolatry helps you understand and filter what's going on in the crazed world we're in. But we need to understand the idols that exist within our heart that are, 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 are ruinous, that are treacherous, that have false promises that we believe. And so I want to show you in Ezekiel 14 where the principle of heart idolatry comes from. We're going to march through these eight verses to give you a sense of the context here. So understanding heart idolatry, idols, idols everywhere it turns out. Ezekiel was a Jewish prophet who lived in Babylon during the time of uh, the Jewish exile in Babylon, and he was a contemporary of the prophet Jeremiah. But Ezekiel spent 23 years ministering to the Jewish people, but in Babylon, and he gave over 50 different oracles, thus saith the Lord type of prophetic oracles. Most of them were addressing false worship and false religion in the uh, Jewish culture at the time, though some were prophetic, uh, future-oriented prophecies as well. Now, in chapter 13, Ezekiel has just given a judgment of God, from God, of two different kinds of false prophets. One type of false prophet claimed to know the future but did not, and another type of false prophet was seeking gain. They were profiting from their prophecy. Okay, they were taking gain from their prophecy, and they were false prophets. God condemned them. And then at the beginning of chapter 14, it says, The elders of, certain of the elders of Israel came to me and sat before me. It's possible this happened in conjunction with that condemnation of the two types of false prophets. Maybe they were seeking clarification, but we're not actually certain. It could have been a while later, but they either way are seeking 
a word from the Lord from the prophet Ezekiel. But God, we notice, has no time to give that to them because there is something much more pressing to address. And God says to Ezekiel, son of man, it was a common designation of Ezekiel. And he speaks to him in this way. And he says, God says, these men have taken their idols into their heart and set the stumbling block of their iniquity before their faces. So not only were there pagan temples and rituals all around them in Babylon, but these leaders in Israel were guilty of bringing them into their heart, God says. Now, 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 biblically, what do we mean when we mean heart? We're not talking about the organ in our body so much as this. The heart is the seat of the will. It's the command center of your thoughts, your motives. It's really the center of what makes you, you. It's the seat of the will, command center of, the th- of the thoughts and motives and what makes you, you. It's really your identity as it were and they're bringing these idols into their hearts see they were fixing their eyes on something other than god putting allegiance and worship and honor and sacrifice toward other things than the living god and they have the audacity to come before the prophet and sit before him expecting a word from the lord Now this reveals, by the way, a pretty terrifying reality that God not only knows all the information that there is to know, but he knows in a penetrating and perfect way every single thing in your heart. There is nothing hidden from God ultimately. And God says to Ezekiel, should I let myself be consulted by them? As in, should I allow them to come to me to seek me for a word when I know everything about their false worship of me, the thin veil of their status as leadership of Israel when really they were worshiping, well, it's going to say, multitudes of idols. And then God goes on to reveal his purpose when he says in verse 4, speak to them and say this. Any one of the house of Israel, and he's even going to say any sojourner, or any, any visitor within the house of Israel. So this isn't just the leaders. They were representative of the nature and the character of the people. Any one of the house of Israel who takes their idols into his heart and sets a stumbling block of his, iniqu- uh, of his iniquity before his face, but comes to the prophet, I will answer him. Why? Verse 5, that I may lay hold of the hearts of the house of Israel who are estranged from me through their idols. God is not going to tolerate worship by ritual, worship merely by habit to bring it into our modern day. Worship by I come to church on Sunday morning and in the reality of my life, the private thoughts of my heart, the motivations and allegiances of my heart are not to the living God. But I come to church, I put on the smile, I, 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 I dress the part, I come in and I leave when it's all said and done, having checked the box. That is unacceptable to God because he wants to lay hold of the hearts of the house of Israel. He wants to lay hold of your heart today because his concern, the truth is, you are estranged from God through your idols. That even as a believer of the living God, through His Son Jesus, there can be a relational, though not eternal, a relational distancing between you and the Lord as you take idols into your heart. They have estranged themselves from me through their idols. God wants to lay hold of their hearts. This is profound mercy that those elders did not just fall down dead before the prophet given all that God knows in perfect knowledge of their heart idolatry, is stunning mercy. He he is going to lay hold of their hearts. And then he goes on, a, a second rendition, as it were, of this statement. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, what should you do? Repent and turn away from your idols and turn away your faces from all your abominations. 
we're going to get back to repentance as really the key for what do I do when, it, when addressing my heart idols. We're going to get back to that by the end of this morning. But then he gives a stern warning here in verse 8 in particular. He says, if, if you do not repent, if you do not turn and you continue taking idols into your heart, he says this, I, the Lord, will answer him myself. I will set my face against that man. I will make him a sign and a byword and cut him off from the midst of my people. And you shall know that I am the Lord. Th this gets at what we might call God's jealousy. God is a jealous God after his own name and glory precisely because that is our greatest good and eternal joy. He is not a jealous God in the way you and I are jealous. We are sinfully jealous because we overestimate our own importance and we think we deserve more than we actually do. God cannot overestimate his own importance and he deserves everything that he knows he deserves. His jealousy is a pure jealousy for his people. And so he wants to lay hold of the hearts of his people who are estranged at times. We can become estranged from God through our heart idols. He's jealous for all of your life. And this warning in verse 8 is worth our attention in this way. Though it's a serious warning and we should still take it seriously, we can also praise God that we live under what we call the new covenant that has been instituted through Jesus Christ. And the reality is, though we need to take God's warning seriously in the Old Testament, we can see that Jesus is the one who actually took the brunt of that just sentence from God upon himself. Jesus is ultimately the one who was cut off from God. God the Father turning his face from Jesus Jesus on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That we in our sin, though we deserve a final and eternal cutting off from God in hell forever, for all who trust in Jesus Christ, who repent of sin, acknowledging their need for the Savior Jesus Christ to be their Lord, the Lord of all, needs to be your Lord of your life, that you receive his grace by faith, you know that he died for you, and when he died for you, he absorbed this very payment, this very punishment that, that you deserve and I deserve to be cut off from the living God. He took that upon himself. He became, 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us, he became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. And so this is a, a, an important gospel connection. That while this is a very sober warning in Ezekiel, we can still rejoice that Jesus, our Savior, is the one that took that penalty for us. And yet really, that doesn't make the call against heart idolatry any less important. That actually makes it all the more important to consider. This principle of idolatry and idolatry of the heart is evidenced in other places. But I chose this passage because God names it for what it is. They have taken their, what they are worshiping in their life, they've brought it into their heart, into the center of their life. They are fixated upon it. Their mind's attention is on it. They fear it with reverence. They give worship and sacrifice to it. And God knows that his people are still capable of this. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to enter a giant biblical counseling session right now. You guys ready for that? Ready or not, please don't leave. I mean, I said that, but please don't leave. Okay, it would be weird if I end up by myself, but um, not that I don't need it, because trust me, as Scott says regularly, it's got to get into the preacher first, and it sure has. But I want to help us identify heart idolatry. How do I understand this? What, what's going on in my life um, that might be signs that there are heart idols going on, and I want to share with these six signs with you. To identify heart idolatry, you follow the signs of fear, hopelessness, control, chaos, anger, and anxiety. When these realities characterize your life, heart idols are lurking in your heart. I said that kind of twice, nonetheless. Heart idols are present when these are characteristic of your life. Now, 
To be clear, um, I cannot just tell you, here's your heart idol, here's your heart idol, here's what it is. I'm going to give you some common ones in a little bit. But first, I want you to understand that these are signs that there are idols of the heart that are gripping us if these are the places we live. So let me give you all six in some detail. First of all, this, signs of heart idolatry, when fear grips your heart. You're living in constant fear, fear of not living up to expectations, fear of loss of certain friendships and other relationships, fear that other people are not respecting you, fear of losing maybe employment right now, and obviously that's a cause for great concern, but there is a difference, and I hope that you would pray to ask God where that line is for you, where there's a concern over losing your job because of how crazy this world is right now, versus the fear that grips your heart that causes sleep sleepless nights that leads you to prayerlessness and worshiplessness. That's the kind of fear that grips many hearts when there is heart idolatry. Secondly, hopelessness abounds. Hopelessness abounds in your life. When you despair of life and you are not coming back to the Lord in whom you have your eternal hope but are despairing of life itself, despondent at every trial with no confidence in God. This is the hopelessness that is a fruit of unbelief in your heart. Thirdly would be control. Control is what you seek. You want to keep the little bit you have. You seek more. You manipulate people through your tears, your lies, your exaggerations, and your selfish chess playing of every relationship that you are in. Control is what you seek. Fourthly, chaos defines your relationships. Chaos is all around you. There is a torrent of unrest and division in your relationships, and you refuse to rest in God's sovereign care over your life, and that He is in control of all things, including the details of your own life. Let me give you a book recommendation, as I like to do, and I'm telling you, if you haven't read it, please, please, please get it. It's called Gospel Treason. Gospel Treason by a man, a pastor named Brad Bigney. Here's what he says about chaos. Idols bring chaos like rats bring disease. Chaos and confusion. You have chaos in your life, particularly in your relationships, and you don't know why. Chaos and confusion almost always have idolatry lurking behind them. Why? Because idolatry of the heart creates war. And that's a reference to James chapter 4, verse 1, when James asks, What's the cause of division and quarreling among you? Is it not that the passions are at war within you? Fifthly, anger is a primary emotion for you. For some, it's a volcanic anger. It erupts at unexpected moments. It erupts on a regular basis. But for others of you, see, that's like the obvious angry person. Others of you, it's that thinly veiled, everything is fine. And and right underneath the surface is that same volcanic heat just simmering. And the people around you are miserable. Are you screaming? Probably not. But, but are you rude and short and unforgiving and demanding and berating and slandering? That's that right under the surface. Harder to see that in a person, but the people suffer around them because of it. For others, sixthly, anxiety is your constant companion. Did I do it right? Am I measuring up? Am I doing enough? What's going to happen this fall now that Newsom won his recall? What's going to happen if X? What if Y country over here? What if this comes true? Anxiety is your constant companion. Listen, we're not saying that any one of those can't happen because they do. They happen. There are things that would cause anxious responses, but when they characterize your life, they are signs that idolatry is reigning in your heart. 
And while I can't predict and tell you what all of them are, I do want to try my best, because some of this is new language to you. I want to try to get at some common idols between the um, eyes in my head, the reasonably working brain I have, and being a pastor here for seven years, I've seen a lot. Read your prayer requests, too. I love you. A lot of counseling time. Seen a lot of idols of the heart that surface. So let me give you uh, three categories of idols of the heart. Three categories to consider and seek the Lord about. One would be this. Idols of what I'm going to call future assurances. Idols of future assurances. And there's kind of two groups of people I have in mind here. One is the doomsday Christian. The doomsday Christian these days is obsessing over what chapter in the book of Revelation are we in right now. How does the vaccine relate to the mark of the beast? Because it has to. By the way, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. Read Revelation 13. It doesn't. Obsessing over when's it going to happen? When are we all going to disappear? Can't wait. It's coming. Here's the thing. Have the thoughts. Go ahead, but do not let them lead you to a fruitless Christian life where you were dissing yourselves from Christian community. You were not serving the Lord. You were not loving your children. Rather, you were obsessing on the phone screen, on the computer screen, in the books, and, oh my goodness, it's coming. You are the doomsday Christian, and it is so obsessive for you. You need to have that broken from your life. Even what could be true and right, right? That's not to say none of that can be happening, but it's to say do not, God does not call you to obsess over it. He calls you to live faithfully. He's given this time in history for you to live in. So stay on mission. Glorify God by making disciples wherever you are. Secondly, though, it's not really of that type of future assurance. You're so sure of the end. It's actually that you have been living... um, with a hidden idol of your heart, with your own personal future assurance that if I give this many years in this industry or in this profession, my retirement looks like this. The picture of uh, health, at least till I'm 82, uh, of my children and my grandchildren all being united, all being in the Lord, uh, everything going honky-dory, enjoying every vacation I want all the time, and you are terrified right now. Because it's not shaping up like you expected it to and you're less than five years away from retirement or you're in retirement and you're terrified right now because it's not going the way you expected it to. You gave God good years. You were faithful in your profession. You grew your business. But an idol in your heart was that you therefore deserved all that you had coming to you and it's not happening. The second group would be this. The second idol, idol of comfort. Idols of comfort. We expect life to be easy, laid back, really just want everything to fall into place. How many times have we said or thought, and I'm one of them, I just want things to go back to normal, as if 2019 was so perfect, right? Like, it's really easy to go back and think, oh, it was so perfect two years ago. No, it wasn't, right? And you want to go back to a heyday, I don't know early 90s, you liked hip-hop, I don't know, uh, the early 60s, the, 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 a, a time 200 years ago, whatever it is, you, you want everything to be normal and comfortable. You expect people to aid your mission of a comfortable existence. And so you are driven to laziness sometimes, you are driven to uh, remove anything that causes pain in your life. And here's the devastating thing. That idol of comfort is going to drive you to seek to soothe your soul in ways that only God is made to do. God, God can do, I should say. And so you go hard to the bottle. You go regularly to the weed. You go back to the porn. Or you're just on the TV all the time. Social media is your just, you're just fantasy land. You want this to soothe your soul because life is so uncomfortable, and so you're going to the thing that's going to give you that comfort, but guess what? The law of diminishing returns inevitably takes place, such that it's never enough. 
And so you either have to try something new or you have to lean into that same thing more. An idol of comfort is ruinous. Thirdly, this, idols of approval. Idols of approval. Desperate for the approval of certain people or society at large. Maybe even in your heart of hearts seeking to earn approval from God. You have a moralistic, legalistic heart like really we all struggle with to one degree or another. Some people, though, get so latched onto it that they work to the bone trying to please gain the approval of that someone or that entity, again, even just society at large. And so a little critical comment will ruin days in a row. That person that's disagreeable with you, that doesn't like that plan at your work, and that talks to you about it, even in a kind way, you are undone. Desperate for approval, so sensitive to every, again, criticism or remark. Idols of approval are rampant in our society, and, and, and this is part of what surfaces the anxiety that so many have. And this isn't to be overly simplistic about it, but it's to say that it's there as a common denominator. How'd I do? Are we all a bit uncomfortable? Try try being me. Up here. Okay, I see you looking at me. Some unhappy faces out there. That's okay. Here's here's the principle, though. If the shoe fits, wear it. Mm -hmm. Right? I wasn't thinking of any one of you in that moment, just so you know. Trying to eyeball some of you. God bless you. You look me in the eyes. I'm like, I got you. I got you. I'm looking at you, right? Like, that's what I need up here as a pastor. I need that eye contact. But it's not because I'm thinking of you. But if the shoe fits, wear it. It means this. Go home and ask the Lord. Lord, is that me? Man, that hit me between the eyes. That comment about all that end time stuff, that's the only thing I remember from the sermon. Chris really offended me. Maybe that's a a marker for you that you should think on that some more. But if the shoe fits, wear it. I hear Scott say that from time to time. It's like people get offended on comments and application, and it's not about you from me, but it's about you between you and the Lord. And ask him not only are any of these three idols, hopefully you wrote them down or will remember to think on them, but what else is there? And there are many that can reign in our hearts. So what do we do? What do we do? Just as God said to the nation of Israel, and he says throughout the scriptures, we repent. What do we do? We, we repent. We repent of our heart idolatry, which I'm going to say is in three steps, as it were, but they're really simultaneous. You turn, you cast down, and you worship God. If you are not a Christian, welcome. You are an idolater. Some form, some fashion, probably a multitude of idols reigns in your heart. And there is only one, the living God, through his son, Jesus Christ, who can bring the rest to your soul that you desperately need in these times. Only he can forgive your sin because Jesus, God, the son who came from heaven to earth, lived a perfect sinless life in your place, died a death on the cross in your place, to absorb the wrath and punishment from God due your sin so that you could be forgiven and granted eternal life because Jesus rose again on the third day. He's ascended at the throne, reigning over all things. He is the Lord. It's time for you to bend your knee and call out to him to be your Lord. Jesus, be Lord of my life. Forgive my sin. I repent of my former religions. I repent of my irreligion. I repent of my self-made man efforts. I repent of whatever idols I can't even understand in my heart. God help me and God have mercy on me. Have we not been talking about this throughout Jonah? The profound mercy of God upon his enemies through Jesus Christ. But those of us who are Christians still have plenty of room to repent. Because idols of the heart are, are either lodged in or they're lurking around. And again, consider the signs. Come to the Lord. What do I need to turn my face away from that I'm spending inordinate amounts of time and attention and emotion and energy on? 
that I'm not giving to you to serve you, love you, and live a spirit-empowered life, loving the people you put in front of me, loving people in my church, loving my neighbors, being about the gospel of Jesus Christ, going to the ends of the earth. What am I replacing you with, Lord? I repent and then cast down. I cast down what I have enthroned. If you're a Christian, Jesus is ultimately on the throne, but we send competing (laughs) idols up to the throne to compete with the Lord Jesus. We cast them down at his feet, and you name it and claim it, by the way. That's our name it and claim it, by the way, all right? You name and claim, that's me, God. That's me. I own that. I am, I'm this way. I'm doing these things. I name it. I claim it. I cast it down. And then as I'm turning in repentance, I'm worshiping you, the living God, once again. I'm trusting in your mercy and grace, trusting your spirit in me to change me. God, give me eyes to see in my heart. Even Ephesians 1 talks about that. May my, the eyes of my heart be enlightened to understand spiritually with wisdom all that God has for me. So we turn, we cast down, and we worship God enthroning Him in our life. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your mercy and grace. Thank you. Thank you. That this word coming to many people today unexpectedly out of Ezekiel and through idols of the heart, thank you for your timing. It is always perfect. And I pray for those here, myself included, that we would take serious inventory of our heart. By your merciful help, help us to see why am I so characterized by anger and anxiety and fear and hopelessness and chaos in my life. God, what do I need to repent of today? What do I need to cast down at your feet so that you alone would be the one I'm pursuing, I'm loving, I'm worshiping. You alone deserve highest allegiance and greatest honor, God. And in this crazy world, in this world that is at enmity with you, help us to understand the day and age in which we are living in and the multitude of idols around us. But help us, Lord, to be compassionate to those around us, even as we call out things that need the calling out. May we entrust ourselves to you, understanding that your mercy is enough, your grace is enough, Jesus is enough. He alone saves, redeems, forgives, restores joy and hope and peace beyond understanding. Help us, we pray, for the glory of your name. Amen.